Welcome to our event, Recipe for Survival, featuring Dr. Dana ellis Hannes. This event is hosted by Actera, Action for a Healthy Planet. We are a Bay Area-based environmental nonprofit, and I'm Robbie Brown. I'm Actera's Healthy, Pla Healthy Planet Program Manager and your host for this evening. I'd like to start today by taking a moment to reflect and acknowledge that I'm currently residing and presenting on the ancestral land and unceded territory of the Tami and Ohlone speaking people. They are the ancestors of the Moekma Ohlone tribe. And if you'd like to learn more about whose land you are on, I'd like to encourage you to start this journey by visiting native-land.ca. This event is part of Actera's Plentiful New Year 2022 Community Dietary Challenge. And during this challenge, we encourage community members to eat more foods that are friendly for the environment. We felt that there was no better way to kick off 2022 than with a healthy start, knowing that your actions are making a difference. And while this challenge is coming to an end on January 31st, we still encourage you to sign up if you haven't already for this last remaining week. I'd also like to thank our community partner, Greentown Los Altos, by generously supporting our Plantiful New Year 2022 challenge. Our partner was very thoughtful and kind enough to award two lucky participants uh, from this challenge with a $40 gift card to a local plant-based restaurant here in the Bay Area. Now, this Plantiful New Year Challenge stems from Actera's Healthy Plate, Healthy Planet program. And with this program, we focus on topics within food sustainability and climate-friendly cooking. And to be more specific, we typically focus on what we call plant-forward eating and then preventing wasted food. Now, I'm not going to go into too much detail because our guest speaker today will be talking about some of this as well. But essentially, we promote you know, eating well for the planet, right? We want to emphasize a plant-forward diet which focuses on fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and legumes. Any animal-based products such as meat or dairy should be limited if incorporated at all. We promote this for a couple of reasons. Mainly, the latest science is indicating that animal-based food groups are more carbon intensive than plant-based foods. And when it comes to health, the consumption of certain meats, especially those labeled as carcinogenic, can lead to health risks and concerns, where a plant-forward diet could potentially improve one's health. And then we also want to work on preventing food from being wasted because in the United States, a large portion of food is disposed of and it decomposes in landfills where it releases greenhouse gas called methane. And with small changes to our daily behaviors and practices in the kitchen, we can all be part of the solution to prevent wasted food. You can always visit our website to learn tips and tricks for portion control and storage techniques for ingredients. Remember, if your food has to be thrown away, please make sure it goes into the compost or your green bin. Now, I'd like to introduce our featured guest for this evening. Dr. Dana ellis Hannes is an assistant professor with the Fielding School of Public Health at UCLA and is a senior dietitian at the Ronald Reagan UCLA Medical Center. She, she earned her bachelor's of science in nutrition and human biology from Cornell University, became a registered dietitian at Emory University, and her master's of public health and PhD in climate change and food security from the UCLA Fielding School of Public Health. And Dana has worked in the United States and overseas, including Ethiopia and East Africa, researching issues of famine, climate-induced migration, and food insecurity. Dana addresses the relationships among climate change, food choices, and food security in her classes and with the media. In her first book, Recipe for Survival, What You Can Do to Live a Healthier and More Environmentally Friendly Life, published by the Cambridge University Press, officially came out today. Dana, congratulations. Incredibly excited for you. And she was generous enough to give us a couple copies of her books. So for those of you that stay for the entire event, you will be entered in our giveaway to potentially win a copy of her book. So please make sure you stick around. And before I hand it off to Dana, I, I was uh, fortunate enough to read some of the book. I haven't finished it yet, but I'm, I'm definitely excited to. And there was a portion of it that really stuck out to me. And this is in the very beginning. And I, I thought I would read this, Dana, if you don't mind, just really quickly, and then we'll hand it off to you. So she says, we are a reflection of our planet and our planet is a reflection of us. And I, I kind of sat back for a second and just really reflected on that line because it, it reminded me of how interconnected and intertwined we are with this place that we call home, right? And then it goes on to say, for far too long, we have not wanted to acknowledge what that looks like from plastic pollution to greenhouse gases. The collateral damage is not pretty. The massive daily carbon footprint from 7 billion people's crushing Mother Earth and threatens to destroy what has taken over 4.6 billion years to create. 
And then Dana says, I envision Earth as a living, breathing goddess, fiercely resilient, yet signaling that she is alien, injured by her reckless actions, dating all the way back to the Industrial Revolution. Fortunately, thanks to scientists worldwide, we have identified the driving forces for these extreme conditions, and we know what it will take to reverse them. We find practical and prudent recommendations for how to get involved so that we are a solution. Now, I think this really kind of sets the tone and theme for Dana's new book, that there's this individual empowerment, that we as individuals can be part of the solution to make sure that this planet, this place that we call Earth, can be sustainable and everlasting. And her book is kind of divided into a couple parts, if I'm not mistaken. And, and the first part really dives into the tipping point, how if we continue on this trajectory, things potentially will get out of our, uh, out of our control and can look pretty daunting. But then the part two of her book is really about the solutions, the recipes, if you will, and how we can protect our planet. And I, I'm just so excited to learn from you today, Dana. Thank you so much for being here. If you have any questions for her, we have a Q&A tab that's open. You can submit your questions in there. Um, but yeah, I'd love to ha hand it off to you now, Dana, if you're ready to go. I'm ready. Thank you so Great. much. You're hired. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I will um, share my screen. Okay. So yes, thank you so much for having me. I, I think I spoke to your group uh, almost exactly a year ago. So it's really a pleasure to be back. Um, and yeah, so this is my book and author talk and hopefully you all have lots of really great questions. So I wanna start off with a quick preface. If Earth were a patient, we would do everything possible to save her. We would give her oxygen to breathe, remove excess carbon dioxide from her lungs and blood and decontaminate or detoxify her from the poisons and toxic sludge that have been building up over the years. We would cool down her fever and provide treatments to rehabilitate her after the years of harm she has experienced. We would do everything possible to give her a healthy and long life. Yet too often humans as a group do not treat Earth and the species that live here as though she is such a patient who desperately needs life support. Instead, we continue to harm her with more toxins. We tear down her cleansing mechanisms and we dehydrate her, pumping out too much water to feed the animals that humans want to eat. If Earth were a patient, we as a collective species have failed her, but we can change that. And let me explain how. So, I wanna have a few key thoughts and takeaways for you to kind of ruminate on as I go through the, the talk. As a species, humans and our choices produce a lot of greenhouse gases. Our survival and the survival of other species depends on us. Reversing climate change feels really daunting. For example, how can I make a difference? But do understand and learn as we go through this talk that your choices matter. What you eat is the single most impactful thing you as an individual do every day. What you spend your money on matters. Earth can heal and repair itself when given the time and left alone. Hope lives, but we must be part of that and we must be part of the solution. I always like to start with a quote from Albert Einstein. Maybe he's one of my heroes from when I was a child, but Truly, it's, it's the truth. Nothing will benefit human health and increase the chances for survival of life on earth as much as the evolution to a vegetarian diet. To have only known what he knew. So just a quick primer in terms of greenhouse gases by sector. As a dietitian, this part is really important to me because of what we eat it has such a role in all of this. So agriculture produces 24% of all greenhouse gases globally, around 7.1 gigatons of carbon dioxide equivalents. But 84% of this comes from animal enteric fermentation, meaning the foods that they eat in their stomach and the production of their feed, including deforestation. So when animals such as cows or goats eat, they produce methane. And so that's where a lot of this greenhouse gas is coming from. So why is it such a problem? Well, the current world population is around 7.9 billion people. Average meat intake in the United States is about 200 pounds per person per year. That is a lot of meat. Whereas in developing countries is about 62 pounds per person per year, but that's expected to increase. So by 2100, we're expected about 10.9 or 11 billion people on the planet and meat intake will increase about 50% in developing countries because they're gonna have more money, they want to spend it on foods that are like what we eat. 
And as meat intake increases and hopefully the energy emissions go down, emissions from agriculture will continue to increase, producing a larger share of the greenhouse gas emissions, which is what you see in this possible future scenario. Today, crops and pasture land use about half of all ice-free land on earth. So therefore, more land will be needed to feed this growing world population. And how do we get more land? Deforestation. Another thing to be aware of is that something like 90% of animals in the United States that humans eat are living on these concentrated animal feeding operations or CAFOs. 80% of all antibiotic use occurs on farms. And by 2030, antibiotic use on farms is expected to increase 69% around the world because of increased meat consumption. So this really increases the risk of antibiotic resistant bacteria and that most of the important antibiotics that we need for health may not really work anymore. This also, because of the animals living in such close confinement, increases the risk of new and emerging infectious diseases. And it is believed that three out of every four new emerging infectious disease will come from animals. And on top of that, the amount of waste that these animals produce, filling up ponds such as this, is terrible for health, theirs and ours, for people who live in close proximity. Not only that, but a lot of that waste ends up flowing downstream into rivers and eventually into the ocean or the Gulf of Mexico, as you see in this picture. So agriculture pollutes fresh and marine waters with agricultural chemicals and animal waste. And this can lead to dead zones where there is so much waste in the water and it grows so much algae that there's no more oxygen in the water. So the fish can't breathe and underwater. Now, food waste is another huge source of, of emissions, as Robbie mentioned. Globally, around one third of all food is wasted. And in the United States, that figure is about 40%. That's huge. It produces 3.3 gigatons of carbon every year, primarily from methane in the landfill. And honestly, that wastes so much water and it wastes a lot of land and resources. In fact, only 3% of water on earth is fresh water. The rest of it is salt water or inaccessible. And agriculture uses about 70% of this fresh water. And in developing countries, it can be as much as 80 to 90% of their fresh water. I'm asked a lot, can fish actually be sustainable? What's the problem with fish? Well, around 90% of fish and fish stocks are fully exploited or overfished. As, and this comes from the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. 60% of fish are fully exploited, meaning you can't continue to take more and more and more and expect that they're, it's going to be sustainable. 34% of fish are overfished, such as the Patagonian toothfish, and only 6% of fish are underfished. And this was as of, as of 2013, it was 10%. So this number has been going down. When it comes to fisheries and overfishing, again, the Food and Agriculture Organization in a report called Fish to 2030 said, supplying fish sustainably, producing it without depleting productive natural resources and without damaging the precious aquatic environment is a huge challenge. We continue to see excessive and irresponsible harvesting in the capture fisheries and in aquaculture. So even aquaculture where they're growing the fish off, you know, not in, the, uh, in, these, in these pens, which I'll show you in a moment, um, it's not sustainable. Several fish species have been declared critically endangered and threatened with extinction by the International Union for Conservation of Nature or the IUCN. These include certain bluefin tuna populations, certain grouper populations, certain swordfish populations, and the Patagonian toothfish, otherwise known as the Chilean sea bass. So how does overfishing occur? Primarily from fishing methods, which from industrial fishing methods, which often lead to high bycatch rates. These include bottom trawling, where you have a big net being dragged across the ocean floor, purse seine nets, which go around a school of fish and then they cinch at the top, pulling everything in. And that can include a lot of non fish or other species that are not the target. Gill nets, which are basically a curtain of, of netting that a fish or other animal swims into and then gets caught, or long lining, which is 
hundreds of miles of baited hooks that anything again can latch onto. Illegal fish fishing is another way. So certain countries might send a fleet to another country in their waters and they will fish those waters to depletion. And then low efficiency aquaculture, where you're putting in a lot of wild fish to feed the fish in the farm and you only get a little fish out. And I'll explain a little bit more of that in a moment. And then here's a short video that does a really great job explaining this in, in detail as well. The earth. There are currently 7 billion people living on 30% of its surface. And all of them are dependent on the remaining 70%, the ocean. The ocean is the largest source of food in the world. Fish is the main daily source of protein for 1.2 billion people. But fishes are more and more frequently returning home with empty nets. Let's turn the clock back a little. Some scientists say that in the last 60 years, stocks of large fish have fallen by 90%. They are warning that we are facing the collapse of all types of fish species in less than 50 years. The reason for this, overfishing. Longline fishing vessels deploy 1.4 billion hooks a year. 1.4 billion hooks, each with a slice of fish hanging from them as bait. There are trawling vessels that cast nets with an opening of up to 23,000 meters squared. The size of four football pitches and big enough to hold 13 jumbo jets or more commonly, more than 500 tons of fish. Amongst these 500 tons of fish, there is a lot of bycatch. Bycatch is marine creatures incidentally caught, often at large quantity. Typically, shrimp trawlers throw 80 to 90% of the marine creatures caught back overboard. This means that for one kilo of shrimp, up to nine kilos of other marine wildlife is caught and wasted. To relieve the strain on wild fish, 47% of our seafood demand is farmed fish. But marine aquaculture is more of a nail in a coffin than a lifeline. Many of the farmed fish are carnivorous. That is, they eat other smaller fish. Five kilos of captured wild fish are needed to produce one kilo of farm reared salmon. Aquaculture just converts low value small fish into higher value bigger ones. It does not create more fish. The majority of European fish stocks are overfished. Historically, EU fisheries ministers have set fishing limits exceeding scientific advice. In 2008, fishing limits were defined for the highly prized bluefin tuna. Scientists recommended a fishing limit of 10,000 tons to rebuild the increasingly depleted population. However, the EU and other fishing nations decided on a fishing limit of 29,500 tons, three times what scientists had suggested. Then, despite this already inflated limit, 61,000 tons of bluefin tuna were caught. That is six times more than the recommended limit. Billions of euro in public subsidies are fueling this overfishing. If this continues, soon there will be no fish left. How do we end overfishing? Your politicians have the responsibility for making the decisions in Brussels that will end overfishing. Citizens have responsibility of encouraging and supporting their politicians to make those decisions. Well, and, and what's true for the EU is true for the United States as well. Um, so I, I really like that video because it does a really great job of succinctly explaining some of the imagery I was trying to explain. 
So when it comes to aquaculture, again, as the video explained, you know, it's, it's really not the boon that we think it is because there are also environmental impacts of CAFO like aquaculture. And I call it that because again, you have thousands of fish in a very confined area, just like with animals on land. Um, so in addition to it not necessarily being sustainable with the amount of fish feed going in versus the amount of fish coming out, you also have to understand that aquaculture has environmental pollution from drugs and other chemicals that are fed to the fish. There is also spread of disease and parasites from these farmed fish into the wild because they're still in the water, usually in the ocean. Um, often there can be entanglement of predators. I mean, a, a shark doesn't necessarily know what a net is. So when it goes to see the school of fish, it gets caught in the nets. Again, the use of wild fish as fish feed is not particularly sustainable. And then sometimes escaped fish can compete with wild fish for food and habitat. This has actually happened quite a bit in the Pacific Northwest with farmed salmon competing with wild salmon for the same habitat. And then of course, pollution and waste from the captive fish has to go somewhere, so it goes into the environment. And just for the record, when it comes to omega-3s, I know everyone thinks you can only get them from fish, but that's just simply not the case. Uh, the Institutes of Medicine actually only have a reference intake value for ALA, which is the plant-based omega-3. Um, and also because our bodies can translate ALA into DHA and EPA in our bodies. But not only that, DHA which, can, is, which is obtained from algal sources in the ocean, the fish eat algae, which contains the DHA. So fish are not the primary producers, it's actually the algae. So when you're eating a fish, you're kind of eating the middleman. It's not particularly efficient. Um, and it's already in use in commercial products such as infant formula, it's called Cryptocodinium coni. And it's an ingredient, for example, in Enfamil, and it's a microalgae oil that you can purchase if you so choose. Or you can just get the plant-based ones from, for example, walnut, chia, flax, things like that. And then I get a lot of questions as a dietitian about protein. How can I get enough protein if I'm just eating a plant-based diet? And it is absolutely more than possible. In fact, the, we don't even need nearly as much protein as we think we do. The average healthy woman typically only needs roughly 50 grams of protein per day. And the average healthy man only needs about 70 grams of protein per day, obviously based on medical history, other things that may or, you know, may, or may not affect your absorption uh, that, can, that can be different. And I would recommend talking to your doctor or a dietitian for sure uh, for more specific information for yourself. But as a general rule, that's sort of the average amounts that are needed. And as you can see, there are a lot of plant-based foods that have a lot of protein in them. So it's really easy over the course of a day to get all the protein that you need from a plant-based source. Now, when it comes to plastic, modern plastics were developed in 1907. They were commercialized in the 1930s and 40s during World War II, and by 1950, plastic production had reached 1.7 million tons per year. Today, there's about 300 million tons per year of plastic that is produced. So that's a 200-fold increase, even though the global population only increased about five times in that same time period. So it's used in all types of consumer products. I bet if you looked around you right now, you'd probably see something that is plastic. Um, and plastics are a problem because they're made from oil, natural gas, and other petroleum-derived products, and they end up in the environment. So they persist in the environment for hundreds or thousands of years, and about 1.1 to 8.8 million metric tons of plastic end up in the oceans every year. And the way that happens is honestly mostly from mismanagement of coastal plastic waste. So we use a lot of plastic, we put it in the trash or possibly even the recycling bin, but it's not really dealt with in an appropriate manner. So a lot of it does end up in the ocean. And once it's in the ocean, plastics can photodegrade because of the, um, the ultraviolet light that's always hitting them and also the wave action. Uh, they turn into microplastics or historically, uh, not historically, in the last 10 to 15 years, there were a lot of products that had these plastic microbeads in them, although it, they've been pretty much phased out by now. 
And so when there's plastics in the ocean, it damages marine ecosystems, including coral reefs. For example, when plastics products snag coral reefs, it can break them. It can entangle and drown animals by getting caught, for example, on a flipper. Um, they get consumed by sea animals, which can affect their feeding habits or their ability to take in enough other food. It releases toxins, persistent organic pollutants or POPs, which bioaccumulate up the food chain. So if you think about it, a little fish is eating a piece of plastic and then a bigger fish eats a lot of little fish and then a bigger fish still eats all those fish. And so it accumulates over time in the fats of those bigger fish and eventually into us when we eat fish. 93% of Americans have been found with BPA residue in their blood. Now that may be because of plastic water bottle use or plastics use uh, in our food supply, but it is also a byproduct of a lot of fish consumption. And there's so much unnecessary use of plastic. I mean, do a does a banana really need to be wrapped in plastic? No. So these are some of the known health effects on the human body from persistent organic pollutants. And this is a, a chart that I put in my book. Um, and basically it can have fetal reproductive effects that are bad for the, for the fetus and also for um, you know, reproduct, reproductive health. It's a possible carcinogen, it can cause cancer. It can have immune or skin or liver issues, behavioral or nervous system, so the brain and then endocrine, which is more of the hormonal. So how much plastic do we all use? If you think about it, we all use on average about 300 single use plastic bags each year, which has in some ways worsened during the pandemic. It was getting a lot better before the pandemic because a lot of states and cities have been enacting plastic bag bans, but then the pandemic hit and that kind of unfortunately went out the window. Uh, on average, we're using 200 single-use plastic bottles every year, and only 7 to 9% of all plastics actually ever get recycled. It gets downcycled into other products such as park benches, flooring, or even clothing, think of polyester, but unfortunately, most end up in the trash. Now, another issue is palm oil. Um, Palm oil is ubiquitous. It's almost everywhere these days. And the problems with it are that it is causing the clear cutting of forests in Indo Indonesia and Malaysia. It is a driver of human induced climate change because we're cutting down these old growth forests and it destroys the habitats of orangutans, Asian elephants and Sumatran rhinos. And they're already uh, endangered. Now, 20 companies are primarily responsible for this deforestation because they have it in so many of their products. In fact, 50% of all packaged foods contain palm oil. So when you're buying products made with palm oil, indirectly and probably without knowing it, you're in a way encouraging orangutan habitat destruction. And unfortunately, this is what it looks like. An orangutan is looking for its home which has been destroyed. So where is palm oil found? It's found in packaged foods, ice cream, cookies, crackers, chocolate, cereals, breakfast bars, cake mixes, baby formula, dry soups, it's in frying oils, it's in detergents and soaps and your shampoos. Um, typically not called palm kernel oil or palm oil, it's typically under another name such as palmitate or sodium laureth sulfate. Um, and just being aware and understanding that it is there is a good idea. And as you can see from the chart on the right, our appetite for palm oil has grown. So just in the last 14, 15 years, um, it's grown from 41 million metric tons all the way up to 77 million metric tons per year. And the only way that is growing is by planting more trees, which is causing more deforestation. And when we're losing animals, what we're really losing is biological diversity. And the reason biological diversity is so important is for resilience primarily, but also just for the richness of seeing all these different species on the planet. Um, do we wanna live on a planet where the largest animal is the, the largest land animal is a cow? Not me, I wanna see a, an elephant in real life. I wanna see these wild animals that are still out there. 
So what we're seeing is in 1900, humans were roughly one sixth of the world population um, of the, sorry, of the terrestrial mammal biomass. Livestock were roughly two thirds and wild animals were still roughly one sixth. Fast forward to the year 2000, and you see that livestock now account for more than three quarters of terrestrial mammal biomass. Humans, almost a quarter, and wild mammals are now only about three to four percent of terrestrial mammal biomass around the world. Yet, when you look at where the biological diversity is in DNA, the species diversity, wild, wild mammals have more than 99% of that genetic diversity, whereas livestock have almost none. They're this tiny little blue line here. So we really lose a lot when we're losing species. So what can we do? How can we be more sustainable? When government fails to do the right thing and to help out in this situation, it is on us. We are the ones who have to do the action. And so that's what I really harp on in the second half of my book is don't just feel sad. Don't just get upset about it. Do something. So what you can do is be an informed consumer. Eat more plants, crowd out the meat. In fact, vegan and plant-based diets can grow 10,000 times as many calories on weight one acre as can growing a cow, for example. And if you look at the chart on the right, you see that plant-based foods, which are on the left, use far less land, far less water, and produce far fewer greenhouse gases than certainly beef, but many of the other animal products as well. How else can we be more sustainable? Well, look out for palm oil. Sustainable palm oil it does not really yet exist in practice. There are companies out there, in fact, I just read an article this morning that are developing um, a mimic a, uh, for, out of yeast, um, and, but it hasn't been brought up to scale yet. So at the moment, it's really hard to find any sort of um, sustainable palm oil. Skip fish oil and choose plant-based omega-3s instead, such as alpha-linolenic acid, ALA, which as I mentioned earlier, are in walnut, chia, and flax. You can also look for algal or algae, DHA, and EPA, because those are the primary producers. Whenever possible, use multi-use products, such as bags, coffee mugs, water bottles, it, even produce bags, instead of single-use plastic products. Create less food waste. Buy only what you will eat, compost what you cannot. We really like to use food lists in our house so we know exactly how much of a product we need to buy so we're not tossing out a bunch of extra. Save leftovers for later by canning, jarring, or freezing. Freezing is one of the easiest ways to save leftovers. Repurpose, you can turn leftovers into a new or recooked recipe. We've done that from time to time. Um, I will sometimes use leftover homemade pesto in a soup the next week, um, if it's you know on its last legs, for example, or we'll freeze it. Use less packaging, buy in bulk if you can, shop at farmer's markets where they typically will let you use your own bags or no bags at all. Look into CSAs, which is community supported agriculture and community gardens. We in fact are lucky enough to do both. We have a CSA we joined and the box that we get every week, oh my gosh, the produce is just beautiful. And in their community garden, um, that's a kind of an old picture now, but we had so much arugula one time, we just, you know, we didn't know what to do with it. It filled like three or four large boxes. Um, refuse, reduce, reuse, and recycle what you can whenever possible, refuse the plastic, reuse what you can, recycle what's left. Be mindful of the types of clothing and textiles you buy. In fact, it's the third most detrimental industry after fossil fuels and plastics. And not a lot of people knew that. I certainly didn't until researching for my book, but um, it, it's really detrimental. Uh, a lot of clothing are made from plastic or petrochemicals, including rayon, polyester, nylon, or spandex. And when washed, they may, re may release millions of microscopic fibers into the ocean. These are called nanoplastics. Um, in fact, there's been studies on this showing that top loading is that washers are actually worse and release even more fibers than uh, front loading, but even so, it still happens. Made from natural materials is better. If you can find cotton, 
Um, silk, if you can find a Hemsa silk, that's even better because it's uh, more ethically made with the, the silkworms. Linen, which is made from flax or wool, again, look for more of the ethical uh, wool sourcing because there are some concerns about when they're shearing of the sheep. Um, look for fair trade and regenerative products. These are some of the symbols used on those types of products, but fair trade is a global movement made up of a diverse network of producers, companies, consumers, advocates, and organizations that put people and the planet first, and they pay a fair wage to these farmers or tradesmen or whatever the case may be for their product. And then regenerative agriculture is where farming and grazing practices can reverse climate change by building up soil carbon and restoring degraded soil biodiversity, which results in more soil and healthier soil in addition to atmospheric carbon drawdown. So what that means is with regenerative agriculture, you're not tilling the soil, you're planting multiple types of crops, you have crop cover. And what it does is by having a, some grazing animals, is you're actually pulling carbon out of the atmosphere and it's going into the soil where it gets fixed and it actually helps grow the crops. So it's really this beautiful synergy um, of, of life and, and carbon and soil. And it, it's just, it's a beautiful thing. There's a lot of really great books and, um, doc, excuse me, documentaries about it. Um, and I was even, again, not particularly aware of it in terms of how much it can do for the environment and for climate change, but at scale, it would make a huge difference. So that's something that we can continuously work on um, when it comes to more of the like agricultural type of farming bills and things like that, encouraging our um, congressmen and, and senators. You can work with and support organizations that do good. So for example, I, I love the Sheldrick Wildlife Trust. They raise orphan elephants in Kenya. Um, the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society is another wonderful organization that tries to protect the oceans and its wildlife. The Four Ocean Cleanup and Advocacy Organization, they do a lot of waste removal on beaches and in the ocean. The International Anti-Poaching Foundation um, or, the, or Akashinga, which is a woman-led and woman-run organization of the IAPF, and they protect um, all kinds of wildlife in Africa. And then, of course, animal rescues and sanctuaries, such as the Performing Animal Welfare Society. So I really am a strong advocate for supporting groups and organizations that are doing really good work, including Actera. Um, know that you are able to affect more change than you think. Don't just sit there and feel overwhelmed, like there's nothing you can do, because every day there are things you can do. Every day, three times a day or more if you're a snacker, there are things you can do. In fact, the most powerful action you can take as an individual is to change your eating habits to be more sustainable. In fact, this is far more impactful and far reaching than changing all the light bulbs in your house and or taking shorter showers. Vote for those who believe in climate change and the action that is needed. I know I'm, I've been mostly talking about what you can do, but voting is something you can do. And it is indirectly efficacious in that the people you vote for may hopefully enact climate action. Um, seek out fair trade, organic and compostable products. Do your part and advocate and educate those around you as if this were an emergency because it is. So for final thoughts and conclusions before we get to the Q&A, engage with others, encourage them to actively participate in protecting earth, change minds one person at a time. That's one of my mottos is sometimes if you can't get a lot of people to do something, sometimes you can get one person to do something and changing that one mind is like changing a whole planet sometimes. Take responsibility and do your part. Lead by example. Be more conscious about your decisions and your level of consumption. Pass on the knowledge you have gained. Read books, watch documentaries, do not give up hope. There's always one more thing that you can do today. Don't think in all or nothing ways. Do your best and keep going. It's a process and a journey. 
support organizations that are doing good. And again, understand that this is a journey. And always remember, the greatest threat to our planet is the belief that someone else will save it. I advocate that you be that someone else. Try to save it. And for more information and resources and significantly more in-depth discussion on all of these topics, uh, my book just came out today. Uh, it's available on Amazon, Barnes and Noble. Um, many of your local bookshops probably will be selling it or you can order them online, but it's called Recipe for Survival, What You Can Do to Live a Healthier and More Environmentally Friendly Life. Great, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hunnis, for that amazing presentation. I got so much out of it and I hope our guests did too. We will now uh, transition into the Q&A portion of this event. Now, I collected some questions from people uh, prior to this event that I would love to ask you and then encourage everyone here at this event uh, to submit your questions using that Q&A tab. So I have my document to the, the right of me. I'm gonna go ahead and dive into a few of these. Um, so the first one is, I, I hear that trees are a solution. Planting trees, they hear that left and right. It, you know, politicians talk about it, celebrities talk about it. Uh, do they have any kind of impacts? And I'm assuming they do since there's so much deforestation with Animal Act, but I'll leave that to you. Yeah, I mean, I actually do talk about it in my book in one of the, in the second half in one of my recipes, planting trees is definitely something uh, that you can do. And absolutely, it pulls carbon out of the atmosphere, produces oxygen. Um, but one thing that they've been finding with these sort of budding little baby trees is that if they're not managed properly, they are dying. And in that case, they're actually compounding the problem. So while planting a tree is definitely a great thing to do, just keep in mind that it has to be planted and then uh, taken care of so that it can grow into a mature tree and really do the work that needs to be done. With that in mind, the problem with cutting down all these forests isn't just that we're cutting down trees and not necessarily replacing them with an equally sized tree, but there's a lot of these forests are primary growth, original forests, they have so much carbon stored in them that when they are cut down, that just releases so much carbon that's been stored for potentially hundreds of years. So you can't make up for that, um, you know, with a baby tree in just a in just a few years. So that is something to keep in mind. Although planting a tree is always a good thing. Great, thank you for answering that. And then uh, another question is, now this is actually from me reading a, a section of your book. You're talking about bioplastics and biodegradable plastics. And this is such a hot topic, especially when I work with restaurants. Uh, compostable foodware is so expensive and there's a lot of greenwashing going on. Uh, do you feel comfortable talking a little bit about that? And if you could kind of summarize the differences, I think that'd be really helpful for us all. Yeah, so again, I, I talk about it in uh, the second half of the book. Um, you know, bioplastics are basically plastics in the sense of um, how they're used and how they're made, um, made out of biological materials. So they end up being very similar to the products that are made with um, traditional plastic, but they're made from a biological, such as a plant, fiber. Um, and so they do break down in a composting facility uh, with appropriate mechanisms and, and chemicals and heat and all of those types of properties. Um, bio, uh, biodegradable plastics, on the other hand, are typically plastics that are made both with standard material plastics, and then they have biological type components mixed in. Um, and again, you're right, composting is a little bit of a misnomer because it has to be done in a composting industrial type facility. It's not something you can just throw it in the rubbish bin or the trash bin and it will compost um, in a landfill. So the greenwashing, I, I totally understand that. Um, if done correctly and appropriately, they are still better for the environment in the long term. And as they scale up, they are becoming less expensive. But as it stands right now, uh, they're not the panacea we all hope them to be. Maybe one day. Maybe one day. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, from an anonymous attendee, they ask, being new to this, which plant-based meats are healthier uh, that is not too processed? Yeah, so I do not necessarily call fake meats such as Impossible or Beyond or something along those lines as healthy. Um, they are still a processed food. They do still have a lot of ingredients in them. They are environmentally friendly. So if you're looking for something that is going to be more environmentally friendly as a substitute for the occasional meat, because I certainly don't recommend people eating meat every day. To me, that's something you would eat maybe at most once a week um, to live a, a pretty healthy life. Um, I would call this a substitute if you want to be environmentally friendly. It's not a health food. Um, I recommend doing like black bean burgers or um, uh, kind of like falafel type patties. So anything with ingredients that you recognize as beans or other legumes, uh, that is going to be a lot healthier than meat and even than some of these fake meats out there. But again, if you're still looking for that flavor, that texture, um, but want to be environmentally friendly, these are a good substitute for that. Great. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And then uh, CJ Wilson asks, I see a lot of fish products labeled as sustainably fished. How does that work? And can that labeling be trusted? I'm actually going to kind of pair that with a question that I had in this document from someone else. There's so many labels these days, uh, so many certifications. And while that can be great, it, it's hard to keep track. Um, I know you mentioned fair trade, but if you have any other labels that people should look out for, please let us know. Yeah, I mean, it, that's an interesting question and conundrum um, because I kind of feel like with all the research that I've done, there's so many companies that want to look good um, and have people continuing to buy their products. And so they will get third party um, certifications, but in practice, how much do they really mean? Is this another example of greenwashing? And so far, a lot of the research points to yes, um, there is a lot of greenwashing out there on fish. Uh, so if you're looking at, for example, sustainable fish, I find that really hard to find unless it's truly like line and pole caught. For example, they have literally one line, one pole, <laughs> and they've caught one fish and they know it's the fish that they are trying to catch. Um, otherwise, any other industrial method of fishing cannot be sustainable with the amount of bycatch that they are getting. Um, as you saw in the video. And also there's a, a great film, I, I think I mentioned it in my book or it may have come out too late called Seaspiracy. Um, and I'm not a conspiracy theorist by any means, but they do a really great job of explaining how dolphin safe tuna, for example, is not, it's not dolphin safe. I mean, they, they this expose is just phenomenal. So I have a hard time believing that um, a lot of these labels really mean a whole lot other than they've been paid for <laughs> um, in many instances. Right, right. Okay. And uh, let, let's move on to the next question. Let's see, why is organic food more expensive? And what are some grocery stores you recommend going to for shopping? So organic food tends to be more expensive because of kind of the regulatory process that goes into becoming an organic farm. Um, I believe it's a it's either a five or seven year process uh, to go from a conventional farm using all types of fertilizers and pesticides and herbicides and things like that to becoming an organic farm. And it costs money for the farmer. Um, and also it's, um, it's more intensive in terms of actual um, labor that goes into an organic farm. So I think for the most part, that's that cost gets translated onto the consumer. Um, in California, we're really fortunate that a lot of organic food isn't significantly more expensive than conventional food. In fact, in my grocery store, I will often see an organic product that costs almost exactly the same or possibly like 10 cents more um, than conventional. Um, but I, I, I think that's pretty much the reason. As far as grocery shopping, honestly, I would say wherever you can afford 
is the best place to grocery shop. If you can't afford organic produce, don't feel bad about it. I mean, eating fruits and vegetables and legumes and other healthy whole grains is far better for your health um, and will save far many more lives than eating a lot of meat and animal products and eating organic produce. So um, when you look at it in perspective, I'm a big advocate for buying what you can afford, washing it, cleaning it as best you can so you can remove as much of the pesticides and and things like that um, as possible. But you, do you need to buy organic? No. Absolutely. And, and on that point, too, of pricing, I've noticed at least where I live here in the Bay Area, I can get organic vegetables and produce at, at such a wonderful price tag um, mm -hmm. at my local farmer's market. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I save so much more money by shopping at a farmer's market. So that's another another suggestion. But um, that's true. Move. Yeah, we have a great farmer's market here just in, a, in our little uh, neighborhood. And, and I've gotten to know uh, the orange farmer, like we buy 10, 10 or 20 pounds of oranges from them every week. And so oh, wow. um, he, he's gotten to know me. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. I love that. Uh, we're running out of time. So I'm just going to ask you a, a small handful of questions. Uh, one question I received was about milk. And uh, this individual isn't quite sure what kind of milk they should get in terms of plant-based milk because they hear like a, a lot of um, negative things about almond milk in terms of water usage and, you know, oat is very popular right now, but it can cause like inflammation. Uh, do you have any recommendations? Um, I think that's a personal choice in terms of what plant-based milk you prefer. Um, as far as water use, when it comes to almond milk versus cow's milk, I totally hear what you're saying. And I know there is this big concern that one almond requires um, a gallon of water to produce. But with that said, a gallon of almond milk is still one third the amount of water as a gallon of cow's milk. So you're still saving the environment a lot of water by switching. Um, as far as other types of milk, I mean, I personally haven't heard that. Uh, Oat milk is inflammatory, and I'm not I'm not sure where that came from, um, because oats are typically used. Uh, they have a lot of fiber in them, and they're really good for the skin um, and eczema and things like that. Um, and as for soy milk, I know a lot of people get concerned about the phytoestrogens in soy milk, but um, I'm personally not at all concerned about those because they really don't act in your body the same way that um, the estrogens that are inherently in cow's milk do because a cow is a mammal and we are a mammal. So that is the same molecule, whereas the phyto plant estrogens from soy are not the same. Great, thank you for breaking that down. I appreciate that. Um, it looks like we have two more questions in the Q&A box. This one is by, uh, apologies if I pronounce your name incorrectly, I believe it's Harada. Uh, are small fish like sardines a better choice or would you discourage them as well? If you are someone whose doctor, for example, has really strongly recommended fish consumption, yes, sardines are a better choice because A, there's many more of them. <laughs> B, uh, they're a lot smaller and so um, they, they reproduce at a younger age. And so if they are being removed from the oceans, there's typically so many of them that it's not as big of a concern. Whereas bigger fish like tuna, salmon, when they're pulled out of the ocean, when they're still kind of small, they ne haven't necessarily had the chance to reproduce. And so you're actually really detrimentally harming those populations. So if you have to eat fish, sardines are certainly a better choice. They've also had less time and ability to accumulate plastics in them. Thank you. And our last question is by Gabriella. And I, I love this question because I dived into the rabbit hole of uh, PFAS. And this says, I read something recently that PFAS is in sparkling water. How harmful are these to people in the environment? I will be honest. What does PFAS stand for? I, I believe it's pre and polyfluoral alkyl substances. It's a uh, the chemical that's added to a lot of foodware to to keep it water resistant. Oh, oh, okay. I have I have read an article about that recently myself. It's like anti yeah water yeah water resistant. Mm -hmm. I'm not a big expert on PFAS. I will be quite honest about that. So, um, no and I don't I haven't really researched that, so I can't 
speak to that, unfortunately, but it sounds like something you don't want to be ingesting <laughs> just <laughs> from what I've read about it. Um, and it is carcinogenic. So, um, I guess buyer beware, just look at what you're buying and be an informed consumer. Sure. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Annis, for being here again today. Uh, I, I, I want to encourage everyone here to buy her new book, Recipe for Survival. I will be sending a link to all of you via email of this recording, but also where you can purchase this book. Uh, we appreciate your time and everyone have a great rest of your evening. Thank you so much.